Welcome to the hydrology course. I'm really excited about teaching this course after doing several one-day seminars on hydrology for soil and water conservation districts. I'm looking forward to kind of expanding on those hydrology topics and hopefully getting other people interested in it. Uh, just a note, if you're here and you work primarily in urban hydrology, we will be covering the basics of urban hydrology and also agricultural rural hydrology. So you'll see references to agricultural BMPs and urban BMPs and the hydrology to come up with design flows for each. Now, what are some of the BMPs that need hydrology studies? Uh, we've got diversions, wascobs, terraces. These are all agricultural practices. Closed drainage networks are typically in urban areas. Uh, flood control can be both. Green infrastructure practices are, are typically urban again. Uh, stream restoration is typically rural, uh, culverts, uh, manure storages. And the thing I want to highlight is that some of these practices only require peak flow rates and others require you to know the entire storm volume. So a peak flow rate is achievable, say, using EFH2 or the rational method. But in order to get the whole storm volume, uh, you'll need something more complicated. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. If you need the, the whole storm volume, you'll have to develop a hydrograph and use a method that uh, provides that. And we'll cover what a hydrograph is in a moment. So first off, I want to give you a sense of what is the best method of hydrology. You know, how uh, we're, we're coming up with stream flows or, or, or storm volumes. What's the best method? The best method is stream gauge data, okay? This is an actual historical record of storm flows uh, at a site. Okay, obviously the problem is stream gauge data only exists for streams of a certain size, and most of our hydrology studies are for small watersheds. So it's rare to find a stream gauge near your, your site unless you're doing a bridge opening or something. Okay, the next best option is regional curves developed from stream gauge data. And these are really useful, except that they have the same kind of size limitations as stream gauges. Okay, the regional curves are developed from stream gauges, so they're only uh, effective on watersheds down to the smallest stream gauged site in your, uh, your region of the state. Okay, so you can't use them on your one acre watershed leading to your, your catch basin. Okay, next best is how we get into hydrologic modeling. Okay, so the SCS, uh, formerly called SCS, now it's called NRCS. Uh, they have two methods. For rural sites, you can use EFH2. For urban sites, you can use TR20, uh, which is sometimes called TR55, which is the pen and paper version of the TR20 method. And then finally, I'd say the least reliable is the rational method although it's still quite commonly used for catch basin closed drainage network design. And for that, it, it is fine. So let's talk a little bit about where you would learn more about each of these topics, because we're not going to cover them all in this course. Okay, for stream gauge data and regression curves, you need to go to your state stream stats program. For New York, it looks like this. And each stream stats program uh, has background documentation. For New York, it's these two documents, uh, Lumia and Freehofer is magnitude of frequency of floods in New York. Uh, that covers um, that covers drainage area and peak flow, I believe. And then this one covers the bankful discharge and channel characteristics. So for New York, we have two components of stream stats, one for the bankful channel cross section and one for the magnitude of frequency floods. All right, how about TR55 and EFH2, those are both derived from the National Engineering Handbook Part 630. Okay, it used to be called NEH Section 4. It's an NRCS publication. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages. You do not want to read it, but there's two derived documents uh, that, that are worth reading. Uh, EFH2 for Agricultural Lands. It's only seven pages. Download it from the NRCS website, or I've attached it here as an attachment to this lecture. Uh, TR55 is also a good, uh, a good resource. Um, like I said, it's kind of the pen and paper version of the TR20 method. Uh, and the TR20 manual isn't really helpful because it's a software program. Uh, but the TR55 manual is really helpful. It goes through the steps and how, how each equation is derived and, and how to use it. 
And I've also attached this to this lecture. Okay, in the rational method, uh, since we're in New York State, I'm going to recommend the New York State DOT Highway Drainage Manual, or Highway Design Manual, Chapter 8, Highway Drainage. Okay, it has a nice little section on the rational method and kind of where it came from and how to use it. Uh, but we will be covering the rational method in this, uh, in this series. So I mentioned hydrographs before, uh, and you might be asking, what is a hydrograph? Well, it just shows the flow rate in a stream over time. Okay, in our cases, we're going to be developing hydrographs for a set amount of time, typically a design storm length. But this is just a regular one for a river. It's a East Branch Delaware River after Hurricane Irene. You can see, you know, before the flows reached the, the gauge, it was, you know, this level, just over 1,000 CFS. And then once all the water in the watershed got down to this gauge, it reached a peak. And then, you know, after the storm was over, it kind of gradually settled down. They had some flood control measures, which is why this is level. And then they let more out, water out and, you know, gradually went down. So this is kind of what we're looking at when we think of a, a hydrograph. This top is just the peak discharge. and a lot of our practices, we only need the peak discharge. This time window from when the flow at the design point or the gauge when it starts increasing to the peak discharge, that's called the time of concentration. That's the time that it takes the furthest raindrops in the watershed to flow all the way down to the design point. Now, different watersheds are going to have hydrographs with different shapes. And I'm going to cover that uh, in this slide. On this side, it shows the effective basin size on the hydrograph, so a very small a watershed. Well, I wouldn't say this is small, one kilometer squared, but uh, you know, it's a small peak flow with a short time of concentration. As the basin size gets bigger, obviously the peak is going to get bigger, but also the time of concentration will increase as well, right? So in this first one, it only takes a short time for the furthest drops to get to the design point. In this one, it takes much longer for the furthest drops to get to the design point. Okay, and basin slope and shape is going to make a difference too. Okay, if you have a basin that's steeply sloped and elongated, you'll have a short time of concentration with a high peak. The more diffuse it is and flatter, uh, you'll get a, a lower peak discharge and a longer time of concentration. I think in this, um, for these three examples, they're all the same area, say in square kilometers, but um, they're each going to have a different time of concentration and peak flow. Now, one thing to consider is storage in the watershed. If there's ponds or wetlands in your watershed, you need to take those into account because water in your watershed will collect in those areas instead of just flowing straight down to your design point. Um, and you can use NEH 630 uh, to estimate the peak discharge in watersheds, in, uh, in rural watersheds, I would say. In urban watersheds with storage, you should break it up into sub-watersheds and use a modeling program such as HydroCAD to, to figure that out. But I think for rural sites, uh, you can use NEH 630. They have adjustment factors for ponds and wetlands uh, to help you figure out what the modified discharge would be for those. Now I want to talk about rainfall distributions. We're trying to come up with how much runoff runs off a site, so we need to know kind of how much rainfall hits the site. We want to know how intense is the heaviest rainfall because that'll pr that'll produce the greatest uh, the flow rates for our BMPs. Uh, historically, we had synthetic rainfall distributions called Type 2, Type 3, etc. It was a storm duration of 24 hours, and the intensity of the rainfall varies over the storm period. Uh, in 2013, the Northeast Regional Climate Center updated rainfall distributions for the Northeast. United States and New York Falls in that. So we should be using the new rainfall distributions type A, B, C, and D. And these are also 24 hour storms. You might be asking, what is a synthetic rainfall distribution? What, why do we use it? Well, 
I'm not going to explain that right now, but I want you to go to TR55 at Appendix B and read the sheet on synthetic rainfall distributions. It's actually a pretty handy tool for doing hydrology uh, so that you know everybody can be using a uniform uh, format of data. Uh, you know, we can, we can get individual rainfall amounts, but we're uh, coming up with intensities that are kind of uniform across uh, the field. So if you're looking for uh, the synthetic distribution type in New York, you can go to this map on the NRCS engineering website for New York. And it just has all the counties and it says whether you're A, B, C, or D. Okay, if you're on one of these tiles that is a border between two of the types, uh, there's blow up maps of those and it'll show you know which towns are in which uh, types. And finally, I want to just uh, show you the distributions. This is what it looks like. This is a synthetic rainfall distribution curve. On the left, you have the cumulative rainfall fraction. So at the top, at the end of the storm, you've received 100% of the rainfall. That would be one times however many inches of rainfall that storm produces. Uh, 12 hours is right in the middle. And then for each specific storm length, say if you have a, uh, a one hour storm, you're going to be sampling uh, the rainfall 30 minutes on either side of this midpoint. Okay, so that's how, if you read the tier 55 appendix B, it says uh, the storms are nested. So kind of the five minute storm is nested inside the 10 minute is nested inside the, the 30 minute. Okay, so for each design storm, we're looking at, you know, kind of half the length on either side making up a total time duration. That's all I want to cover in this introduction. Uh, I'm attaching those uh, reference documents. You definitely browse through those so you get a sense of, of where to learn more and where to look up uh, answers to your questions. Probably the most important step in doing hydrology is creating an accurate drainage area. And to create an accurate drainage area, you're going to need accurate contour lines. Now there's basically three ways we can get contours. We can do a survey ourselves, we can rely on flown LIDAR scans, or we can rely on a USGS topo maps uh, from the 60s and 70s. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about both and how we can combine them. First up, you might have a survey that you've done with a total station, or you could have a grid survey done by uh, using your level. And if you input that into say EFT or Civil 3D, uh, you can develop triangles and from the triangles you can develop contours. This is probably the best bet, but oftentimes we don't survey the entire watershed of a practice that we're designing. We'll just design the site area needed to construct it and then kind of fill in the watershed contours with something else. For example, a LIDAR. So LIDAR is available for, I'd say, one half to two thirds of New York State. You can get it from the GIS Clearinghouse, download it, process it in ArcMap, display contours, uh, what have you, and then uh, delineate the rest of your watershed using these contours. Then finally, in areas that we don't have LiDAR coverage, you can use USGS contour maps. And these are also available as digital elevation models from the Clearinghouse so you can uh, play with them in, in GIS as well. They're not quite as accurate as the LiDAR, uh, but they're, they're generally suitable for kind of large, large size, uh, low detail watershed studies. Uh, with any drainage area mapping, you're going to need to ground truth it, uh, it after you've mapped it out. So here's kind of uh, the basic principles of drainage area delineation using contour maps. The first thing to do is come up with a design point. Okay, a design point for most structures will just be the structure itself, say for a manure storage or for a catch basin or for a pond, the design point is just the structure itself. For a linear structure such as a diversion, your down point, design point will be the most downstream point. Okay, so you wanna start from your design point and then go up into the watershed going perpendicular to the contours. And when you're doing your delineation, you'll be looking for hills surrounding the watershed uh, and you'll be connecting lines between the hills. So in, in this watershed, these two hills represent 
uh, border points on the watershed and the other border point is this saddle between the hills. Um, you can look at the contour shapes to help you do help you do your delineations. Uh, on water courses they always point uphill. See these these contours kind of bend and make an arrow? They point uphill. On a nose of a hill, see there's no water course in this area, the contours point downhill. So in this watershed you'd be coming up perpendicular to the contours, up to the top, across, and then back down. So uh, a ground truthing is really important, especially if you have roads or man-made features, because they don't always get picked up in the LIDAR. Uh, you might see it as kind of a jagged contour or a little blip, but it's not very apparent. So it's really important to be able to walk your watershed uh, to get an accurate idea of the map. Now GIS has some tools for hydrology and they are useful to some extent. However, they're mostly geared towards doing hydrology for existing streams. If you're creating a new structure, say a new diversion, uh, you won't be able to delineate the drainage area for that using say a DEM or a LIDAR geotiff. Uh, you'll need something with existing streams in it. But if you are working on a stream, uh, computer models can be great. So this is stream stats, as most of you should be aware of, uh, for New York. Um, its kind of limitation is that you can only delineate areas that are located on one of these blues, uh, one of these blue line streams. So you have to be zoomed in far enough for these to appear, and then you can only do watershed small enough uh, on these. But all in all, the computer um, methods are kind of neat because they'll give you ideas for how the water might flow that you might not otherwise think of. Here's kind of a same, similar delineation in ArcMap uh, for these two, two points. They're on existing water courses. And uh, these are the delineations that ArcMap come up, came up with. Like the shape of this, the shape of this, it'd be pretty hard to come up with that on your own just using hand methods. So let's jump over to ArcMap. And I'm gonna show you a couple demos of delineating watersheds uh, kind of on the fly. This is a good time to talk about GIS in this course. To get the most out of this course, you should have some way to manipulate LiDAR data, DEMs, and TIFFs. And to do that, you'll need uh, ArcMap's Spatial Analyst add-in, which requires an ArcMap advanced license. I know many of the soil and water districts might not have uh, an advanced license or Spatial Analyst add-in. And if that's the case for you, uh, you should look into downloading QGIS or QGIS and using that for the spatial analyst features it has. It's a free program and it has most of the spatial analyst tools uh, that we'll need uh, built in uh, for free. If you do have ArcMap with the spatial analyst extension, uh, you'll be all set. And later on in the course, I'm gonna be showing workflows for hydrology stuff uh, using both packages, both with QGIS and ArcMap. For this course, I'm gonna assume that most people have kind of a basic understanding of Arc ArcMap uh, or GIS and and how to use it, uh, but I'm going to go pretty slow uh, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. This is a map of the Adirondacks. Here's Mount Marcy, Skylight, Haystack, and uh, the reason I chose this area is because it's easier to delineate drainage areas when there's lots of relief in the map. It's hard to do on really flat areas. So when you're just starting out, you should do a few uh, really mountainous areas to help get your feet on yourself. This USGS topo map is just found up here. You go to add data. Oops, cancel. Add base map. And it's just the USA topo maps layer. This is kind of a streaming web service that Esri provides. You select that and it'll, it'll pop in here. Okay, next up we're going to create a shape file to put our watershed into. So you'll look for catalog. Uh, for mine it's docked over here, but hidden. Find the folder where you want the shape file. For me it's going to be my hydrology folder. Right click, new, shape file. Give it a name, say Marcy Watershed. You have to tell it what type of uh, features are going to be stored in it. Watersheds are polygon features. And the coordinate system, uh, click edit. Um, and I'm going to use a projected coordinate system. 
uh, called UTM. The datum it's based on is North American Datum 1983. And the zone I'm in is called 18N. That's the zone we use here for, uh, for a lot of our GS work at the office. Click OK and OK. It's going to get an error because my base map is not in NAT83 UTM zone 18. Uh, that's OK. I can reproject on the fly. All right, and once it's in there, you'll see it on the, the table contents, but there's no features in the map yet because we haven't created them. To do those, you look for your editor toolbar, click the drop down, and do start editing. And that should pop up a create features window. If you don't see your create features window, I go back to the editor drop down, go down to editing windows and just click this and it'll click back on. If you close your create features by accident, it'll or like remember that for the next session and it won't have it on. So just leave that open or click there. All right, click on the layer that you're gonna edit. Okay, and then we're gonna be using the polygon tool. So here you need to figure out what your design point will be. And for this exercise, we're just gonna use a point on this uh, stream here. It's a tributary to Marcy Brook, I think. Say we'll start right here. Now you want to go up into the watershed going perpendicular to the contour lines. So you don't really need to try and get too detailed on this. Uh, from this point, so you could go up at this angle or try and hit these at this angle. I, I'd say go, go like this and just try and go up this mountain perpendicular to the contours all the way to the peak. Okay, and then, you know, I see this gray peak over here. Maybe that's in the watershed. Mount Skylight. I think Mount Skylight is a direct shot up there. But I'm not really sure. And then I see this, this kind of funny area in here. There's contours coming up, pointing this way, coming up, pointing the opposite way here. And that means there's a saddle in between these two peaks. So a saddle is going to split the drainage area. I know it's going to come down, hit kind of the middle of this this point, something like this, hit the saddle, come back up the other side to the other other peak. All right, and then it's gonna come perpendicular down the contours back to my design point. And for arc map, it is double click to end. All right, that creates my kind of drainage area. Remember, if you wanna change the symbology, you can do right click on the layer properties uh, symbology and change it here or you can just click on the, uh, the icon here. I like to do no fill on these because it makes it easier to see the contours underneath. All right and then there's my watershed. If I need to edit points I'll go up to here to the editor toolbar. You, you might have to stretch this out to get these buttons to display. And edit points is this one, edit vertices. Okay, and when you uh, are over a point that can be edited, it'll just uh, do a four-way selector. And you can move these out and around to uh, wherever you want them. And then for arc map, it is just click outside uh, outside the box to get that to, to end. All right, let's do another one uh, over here. Okay, go back to my polygon tool. Let's do, how about down in this part of the gorge? Start here, then we're gonna go up these contours, up either to a ridge or directly to a peak. I think in this case, it's not gonna hit the peak. It's just gonna go to the ridge. Down to here. And then this is another saddle between these two little peaks. So it's gonna hit that. Then I'm gonna kinda of look up in this area for another saddle, and here's one. So I think it's gonna come down more or less perpendicular to these, to the saddle. And then in this area, I have to, I have to decide if it's gonna go all the way up to the, the peak of Mount Marcy, or if it's gonna be on this nose type ridge over here. One thing to look for is other sal saddles and other Kind of streams uh, adjacent to it. See this this area here shows kind of another stream forming that comes down from the saddle 
it curls up into uh, Johns Brook. So we know some of this watershed is not going to come down to ours. So we'll just start by kind of, you know, roughing it in. Why don't we go all the way to the top, you know, just, just as a start. And there you kind of have it. There's your, your basic watershed. It is much harder to do on a flat site. So definitely practice with a few really steep sites. So if you have ArcMap, I want you to open that up and uh, go ahead and browse to uh, an area that's hilly and delineate a few areas uh, on your own. And that'll give you some practice in how to do it. Hopefully by now you're somewhat comfortable with delineating watersheds using USGS contour maps, but let's look at how you can use LiDAR data in New York uh, to get a little more detailed view of the contours. So you should know about the New York State GIS Clearinghouse already if you're working in a soil and water district in New York. So just browse to that. If not, just Google search it. Once you're on the home page, you click on the ortho imagery link here and then start the ortho imagery application. And this is their kind of a web map portal where you go to download aerial photos if you want to use those in GIS. First click over on the layers button over on the right. And let's turn off all those orthos. That'll let us see what DEMs are available better. So the lighters are stored as DEMs. That's a digital elevation model. You see these all these different options all the way from 0.7 meter resolution that's the distance between points in the grid so a smaller uh, meter number means it's more accurate 0.7 meter all the way up to 10 meter now these 10 meter DEMs are just uh, derivations of USGS contour maps they've been scanned in and digitized uh, so they're no better resolution than the contour maps even though they are digital so let's turn that off and turn off, turn on all the other ones. And all these other ones are derived from LiDAR scans. So if you're trying to get an idea of what's our overall coverage in New York for LiDAR, this is basically it. It's all of Long Island and, you know, some of the southern tier and then kind of scattered counties uh, in between and around. So hopefully you're in a county that has LiDAR coverage. If not, then you don't get don't get to use it. All right, so let's look at how to download it now. Uh, say we're over here in Livingston. As you zoom in, it'll limit your layers to the only the ones available in that view. So that's kind of nice. I'm going to turn them off off for now and find a farm. Uh, that we can use as an example. Let me make sure to get one that's uh, on a border. How about... How about right here? Alright, so say our project is in this area. Okay, 1 meter DEM index, USDA, UTM 18N. That is the, the layer that's available, and it shows that there is coverage in that area. So to download it, you go to this download folder over here. It's a folder with a little arrow on it. I click on it. Uh, I usually do current view. And then it'll give you the option to download orthos. Uh, but we don't need those. We're going to use a web service for those. Uh, so we want DEM results. Show tile list. And then each of these image files needs to be downloaded separately. Just right click it, do save link as. Then I'm just going to put it on my C drive in the Cortland folder uh, right here. Save that one, then do the right click, save link as. Same folder, save it. All right, now let's jump over to GIS and see how we load those and generate contours. 
Now remember, if you're going to use Spatial Analyst to display contours, you'll need a Spatial Analyst license, which requires an ArcMap Advanced license, uh, unfortunately. So here you see I've got my Advanced license running. Okay, go to Extensions, make sure that's, that's active. Yep, Spatial Analyst is active, it's checked. All right, so now I need to add those DEMs to the map. So I'm going to go to Catalog, add them. It's going to ask you if you want to do pyramids. Um, you can or you don't have to. I'm going to do no just for the sake of time. It's in a different coordinate system than my base map. That's fine. Let me grab the other one. No. Okay. So just to zoom to layer on one of those to bring it up. This is what a uh, geotiff looks like. The highest points are indicated by white and the lowest points are indicated by black. And in the legend, it shows you what those high and low values are. You know, 342 meters to 284 meters. And you got to know that th these are like separate ranges for each tiff. So here's the highest point on this right one is bright white, right next to the lowest point on the next one. You know, so that's not seamless. Each one has its own elevation range and colors. So in order to really visualize this, let's try and generate contours. Go to Spatial Analyst, which you can find in the Arc Toolbox. That's this little red toolbox button. Um, scroll down to Spatial Analyst Tools. And inside there, you're looking for the Surface Tools. Inside Surface Tools, you want Contour. OK, it'll ask for an input raster. Let's just do 311. It's going to put polyline features in. It's looking for a geodatabase, so I'm just going to use my default geodatabase. I use that for lots of stuff. Contour interval, uh, this is the spacing between the contours that you want. And we're going to convert it to English. Uh, so you can put in your, your English contour interval here. It's going to be, let's say, 10 feet for us. Okay. The base contour, if you want contours every 10 feet on the 10s, just use zero, and that'll be the best, uh, best bet for you. Z factor. This is going to be that conversion factor from English to metric. So since we're going from metric to English, I like to remember it as English feet are smaller units than metric. So if I have uh, 100 meters, I'm going to have much more feet. And that means I'm going to multiply by a number bigger than one. And fortunately, those conversion factors are right in the help over here. Uh, if you could just scroll down. And it's... Uh, so this one is a second one for another example. Consider an input raster in WGS84. Elevation uses of meters. You want to generate contour lines every 100 feet with a base of 50. OK, we're doing a base of 0, and so on. Set the contour, contour interval, the base contour, and the z factor to 3.2808. So we're just going to use that bit of information, 3.2808. Hit OK. And then it'll chug along. I have it on uh, no background geoprocessing, so we'll see how it goes. Close it. Close that. And then you have your contours. So now you can use this data uh, to generate your watershed. Definitely want to note, though, um, when you display the LiDAR contours, they're very jagged. That's because the data is, is very dense and it hasn't been smoothed by, by computers yet, although it can be. Uh, you can do that to get a better map view. And I mention this because one of the methods that we typically use for hydrology is the average slope of the watershed to get um, time of concentration. And one of the ways we do average slope is the contour length method. And if you're using LiDAR data with really jagged contours, um, if you try and do contour length method in GIS, where you just add up the lengths, of the features, it's not going to work quite right because the contours will be too long. Okay, the contour length method is meant to be used by hand methods on USGS contours, and not using a computer on LiDAR contours. So just bear that in mind. We're going to look at some other ways to do the average watershed slope uh, later on too. All right, so um, if you have Arc ArcMap with Spatial Analyst, uh, check and see if there's LiDAR available in your area. Uh, download some and try and display those contours.
Once we have our drainage area mapped out, we need to determine what fraction of rainfall comes off the ground and runoff. We know a portion of it will soak into the ground and that won't be available to our drainage best management practice down at the bottom of the, of the watershed. And in the NRCS methods, the runoff fraction is determined by two factors, a land cover type and a hydrologic soil group. So check out this table here from TR55. You can download the full TR55 manual uh, as an attachment to the introductory lecture. If you look through it with me, uh, the first section is for fully developed urban areas. And there's different types, uh, impervious areas, parking lots, streets, open space, lawns. And then for each hydrologic soil group, there's a different rating. We're going to cover hydrologic soil group in just a moment, but as you can see, the A soils have a lower CN value and the D soils have a higher CN value. And the higher the CN value, that means the higher the rainfall fraction will come off and run off. If you scroll down, you can see there's another table for our cultivated agricultural lands or crop lands. And in these, it's important to note that there's ratings for different hydrologic conditions, poor or good. And the difference between poor and good is basically a design decision that you'll have to make. Uh, two people looking at the same field might give it different ratings. But that's okay, it's your designer's preference. If you keep going down, there's another section for other agricultural lands, like pastures, meadows, brush, woods. And if you keep on going, there's one for range land too, but we don't really have much of that in New York, so you don't have to worry about that. Now getting back to hydrologic soil groups. The hydrologic soil group rating is not really for the top layer of soil, it's really for the whole soil profile. So this is the table that shows how they rate hydrologic soil groups for each soil type. It's from part 630 of the National Engineering Handbook, and it just shows they're considering the depth of the impermeable layer, so that might be the water table or bedrock or um, some other impermeable layer. Okay, depth to high water table by itself. The saturated conductivity of the least transmissive layer in the depth range. What depth they range and what depth range that occurs at. So they basically go through this tree and figure out what hydrologic soil group it should be. So the important thing to remember is it's for the whole soil profile, not just the top little bit. And lastly, on runoff coefficients, I want to talk about C values used for the rational method. Uh, typically, we don't consider the hydrologic soil group when using the rational method, and we typically use the rational method in urban areas. So uh, a lot of people count this as a strike against the rational method, or at least its implementation, that we don't use hydrologic soil group. Uh, but I found that it does work fine for urban storm drainage networks, and it's really quite simple and, and easy to use. Now let's talk about how you would look at your watershed, chop it up, and assign CN values to each part. Here's an example watershed. There's five different soil names, but only two soil groups. So this pink part is group C, and then there's a little strip of group B on the inside. That kind of covers the areas of hydrologic soil groups, but we also need to merge in what the land use is in each area. Suppose there's three sections of land uses of two different types, pasture, good condition, and woods, fair condition. If we overlay those, we'll get five sub areas, pasture, good, group C, woods, fair, group C, etc., etc. So the process of hydrology modeling is chopping up your watershed into all these little sub areas and then combining like types and creating a weighted CN value. Areas with a higher CN value are going to get more weight if they have more area, and areas with a lower CN value will get less weight if they have less area. And fortunately, we have software that helps calculate these weighted averages. Here's EFH2. It just has a chart on the RCN tab where you type in your, your land use, number of acres of each soil group, and it gives you a weighted CN value. Here's a similar input for HydroCAD. You open up your watershed, then select curve number, and it has the same basic stuff, all the different land types, all the different soil groups, and, uh, and descriptions of each. One other thing to consider 
you, you can get your land uses just by looking at the land, but where do you get the hydrologic soil group? There's a couple sources for that. First up, there's county specific tables for hydrologic soil group in eFOTOG. All right, so say you're in Cortland County, you can just download all the soils for a chart with all the soils for Cortland County and it'll have each hydrologic soil group. Alternatively, there's a chart for the entire state that lists all the soils in the state and their hydrologic soil groups. There's web soil survey. Hopefully you're familiar with this. If not, just Google web soil survey and poke around in it a bit. It's really quite neat. And in the soil properties tab, you can uh, display the hydrologic soil group. And then finally, Soil Data Viewer is an extension for ArcMap. Um, you don't need anything beyond the basic ArcMap license. It's an extension you download from USGS and it makes this little viewer and enables you to display maps of basically any of the soil properties that you can find in Soil Data Viewer. Um, it can display in ArcMap. All right, and we're gonna cover basically how to create a map with all these soil groups in it, and how to chop them up into different land uses and hydrologic soil covers. And we'll be using GIS to do that uh, in the next couple lectures. Soil Data Viewer is a really interesting add-on for Esri's ArcMap, but it takes quite a few steps to get it installed and running. Now, if you don't have ArcMap and you're using QGIS for this project or for this course, uh, don't bother trying to create a hydrologic soil group shapefile uh, on your own. Just email me and I'll create a hydrologic soil group shapefile for you and send it out to you. Uh, but if you do have ArcMap, it's definitely worth getting Soil Data Viewer up and running because it can display all kinds of soil data in your uh, GIS platform. So the first thing we need to do is download it from NRCS. So just search for Soil Data Viewer. and you look for the download and install Soil Data Viewer link. That should bring you to this page. Okay, remember, if you're outside of NRCS's common computing environment, you might have a little bit different steps, and that's what I'm doing. I'm outside the CCE. So I'm gonna scroll down until I get to installing Soil Data Viewer 6.1 on non-USDA CCE platform. And click the big download button. There's just one file in the zip file, and that's the installer itself, an MS fi MSI file. So extract that to your desktop or something. And then run it. Okay. Go ahead and confirm the installation, and you'll need to have administrator privileges to install this. Okay, that gives you some information. Do next, and wait as it is installed. It should install pretty quickly, and once it's done, you can click close here. And go back to those instructions that were on the uh, NRCS website. We need to register Soil Data Viewer as an add-in. It doesn't register itself with ArcMap automatically uh, for versions, I think, six and above. So basically, look for the instructions here. I'll say registering Soil Data Viewer 6.1 as an add-in to ArcMap. It'll tell you a folder to browse to. This is the installation folder. I'm using 32-bit Windows, so it's a little bit different. It's going to be C program files, USDA, Soil Data Viewer 6.1. So if you're using 64 bit Windows, it'll be program files x86. And then you're looking for the file called SDV ArcMap Add-in dot Esri Add-in. And you need to run that file to, to register it with ArcMap. So I'm just going to scroll down to S, SVD. 
All right, and see there's the addin.dll, but I'm looking for addin.esri addin. So here it is down here. Okay, remember there's going to be two files with that name. You'll need to double click the one with the right extension. All right, then it's going to bring up the addin installation utility, and you just want to confirm that you will do it. Install addin. Okay. All right, once that is installed, go ahead and open up ArcMap. And this will give us an idea of what kind of data Soil Data Viewer needs in order to run. Now I'm just running the basic license of ArcMap. Okay, Soil Data Viewer can be run on basic. Uh, you don't need an advanced license or anything. Uh, just look around on your toolbars for the add-in. It should be up in the upper right. Um, click it. Alright, and you get this warning. It says, in order to run it, you must select a valid soil map layer. This means a shapefile. Okay, you need a soil shapefile in order to run this program um, and get any results. In addition, you need a database that contains all the soil information. So it's not looking for uh, attributes attached to the shapefile, it's looking for a separate database where all those attributes are stored. Okay, so it's a little bit different from the way we usually use GIS, or we use it in basic terms. Uh, the attributes aren't stored in the shapefile, they're stored somewhere else. So we're going to have to provide Soil Data Viewer with a map layer, that'll be a shapefile, and with a database. That'll be a Microsoft MDB file. So let's look at where you get those. Close out of that. And here we're going to go to Web Soil Survey. Start Web Soil Survey. And you want to look for the tab that says Download Soils Data. And you can download them for your area of interest. Okay, we're not going to do that. You want a Soil Survey Area. That's Surgo. Click that. Pick your state. Say we want to do New York State, Cortland County. Okay, and then it will give you a download link uh, in order to get that. So you click here and download the zip and extract it to your folder. I've already done this, so I'm not going to do it right now. Uh, and this is a little bit finicky. Sometimes it takes a couple download tries. And once you've downloaded that data and extracted it to a folder, these are the folders and files that you'll have. You've got a folder with spatial data. That's just got a bunch of shape files in it. A folder with tabular data. That's a bunch of text files. And these are, for the most part, unreadable, uh, except by their template database. Like this one, they don't have column headers and whatnot. Uh, back to the main directory of README, uh, some metadata, and this template database. This is probably the most important part. The template database is used for building the county-specific database. So. Uh, in order to use this database with Soil uh, Data Viewer, you're going to have to prep it to be used. So double click it. Hopefully you have access installed. It's going to ask you if you want to run a macro, and you do in this case. Enable content. And then it pops up this dialog. This is where you type in the directory where your tabular data is stored. Okay, uh, you can't browse for it unfortunately, you have to type it in or cut and paste. Fortunately, I have uh, used a very simple directory, C Cortland slash tabular, then click OK. And then it's going to run a macro that loads all those data files from the tabular folder into this Microsoft Access database. Once that's done, then we can select this database as the one to use for a soil data viewer, and hopefully it'll work right. And that should take a few minutes. Once you're done 
loading that tabular data, you can save the database and close it. Uh, then go back to ArcMap. Now we're going to load in the Cortland spatial data. So remember, for my example, it's in C Cortland spatial. And then you're looking for a polygon shapefile, uh, and those are indicated by these icons. Um, it's like a box with little lines through it. You want soil mu A NY023. Add that to the map. All right, so if you zoom in, you can see each little shape area is in that shape file. All right, and I'm just going to delete the fill, the fill on that uh, for, for later. I just don't want it to have any color on the inside. All right, now let's start up Soil Data Viewer again. Hopefully we won't get an error. Right, we'll get a Select Soil Map Layer dialog. You might have, you know, four or five soil layers in your map, but you can only use one in Soil Data Viewer, so you select that, which one you want to use. Okay. Click OK on that. All right, and now you need to specify which database you want to use. In this case, we're going to browse to... Oops. C... Portland, and this right here. That's the database we just uh, ran the macro in. Okay, so now that those are both loaded, uh, you can use any of these drop downs to uh, select something to map. And we're going to pick soil qualities and features and look for hydrologic soil group right here. And that gives you the description of what that means, you know, the A, B, C, and D soils. And, uh, you know, read through that, make sure you know what you're doing, and then click Map. And it should chug along for a couple seconds and give you your map. Here it is in the legend, A, B, C, D, C slash D, A slash D, and B slash D. Uh, those are important to note. Um, you'll see this in any of the charts. It'll say uh, for an undrained condition, it is D. For a drained condition, it is A. And uh, drained condition just means you have tile drainage in a field, draining water uh, artificially. So if you have a, a cornfield and it says A slash D, but they're growing corn successfully, then it's probably drained. And you can use the A value for that. All right, so definitely go ahead and download Soil Data Viewer and try and get it running. If you get stuck, uh, definitely uh, email or give me a call. The next couple lectures, we're going to look at using this data in ArcMap or in QGIS uh, in order to create our weighted CN values. One last quick thing to mention about Soil Data Viewer is that it creates temporary files uh, that get dumped at the end of your session. So if you want to reuse this hydrologic soil group layer, you need to save it, and you need to save it as a file geodatabase feature class. Don't save it as a shape file, because any null values in the file will be interpreted as zeros, and you don't really want that. So go down to, uh, just right click on the layer, go down to Data, Export, and then on this folder browse, you'll be able to select whether you want it to be a shapefile or a file and personal geodatabase feature class. So just do geodatabase feature class, uh, create a new geodatabase if you need to, and then give it a name, and you'll be all set. Alternatively, NRCS does have an SDV saver tool, which you can download, and I have. It's only really useful if you want to automatically join multiple tables into one feature class. Uh, which could be useful if you want. Um, I'm not really going to recommend it in this. It's kind of a labor to install, but uh, if you're interested in that, that's definitely out there, and I'll post a link to where you download that in the description for the lecture. Let's look at a basic watershed shape and try and determine the weighted curve number value that we can assign to the watershed for the hydrology analysis. 
Here I've just got a sample shape that represents a watershed on mostly agricultural land. I've also got the soil uh, boundaries for that area. This is in Cortland County, New York. I've also got the hydrologic soil groups. I'm going to need those for my analysis. Now, the curve number is kind of a combination of hydrologic soil group and the land use. We don't really have any available data sets for land use, so we need to digitize and assign that ourselves. And to do that, we're just going to draw around shapes in ArcMap uh, and create features in a shapefile. So uh, there's multiple ways to do that. I'm just going to go to Catalog, find the folder where I want it, right click, go to New, Shapefile, give it a name, maybe Land Use. The features are going to be polygons. And then for the coordinate system, I'm going to do UTM Zone 18, uh, NAT 83 datum. Okay. Okay. And then I'm going to quick change the symbology to be no fill, because uh, that usually works better for me drawing stuff out than purple. I said, and remember when you're working in ArcMap, you need to start an editing session in order to draw anything. Uh, so you'll go up to Editor, Start Editing. It'll ask you which layer you want to edit. Obviously, land use is the one we're looking at. Click OK. And when you click over in the Create, that should bring up the Create Features dialog box. If you don't see Create Features, go to the Editor, Editing Windows, and click Create Features. Sometimes this gets uh, disappeared for some reason. Click Land Use, and that'll give you your construction tools, uh, and you're going to do Polygon. So now I just want you to trace over each land use area. In this example, we're going to use two types. We're going to use pasture in good condition and woods in good condition. So we're just going to make shapes. It'll snap to these borders. Uh, make shapes of the, the crop, pasture land, and uh, the woods. So we're just going to kind of outline uh, where you think the woods end and the pasture starts. Something like this. It doesn't have to be perfectly exact, but obviously the better you can get it, the better your results will be. And you just have to trace around the border uh, to get your shape. Remember in ArcMap, it is double click to end your shape. Maybe something like that. All right, and then we'll add another one for this area of woods. Okay, so now we have two. We're going to zoom in and do this little area. this one. All right, and I think if I was doing this as a real study, I would make this more detailed and probably include this pond uh, and maybe these kind of hedgerow tree lines. But for this example, let's keep it simple and just stick with these four. Now we've got our shapes made, but if you go over to the attribute table, you'll notice there is no attribute data. So in order to use this, we need to add some attribute data. So to first uh, do this, we're going to add a field to this table called land use. If you uh, click on this drop down here, it'll say uh, add field, and add field is grayed out. So in ArcMap, you have to be out of your edit session to add a field uh, to the table. So we're going to close this, go to Editor, Save Edits, Stop Editing. Go back to the attribute table and add that field. It's just going to be called land use. And the type is going to be text. We're just going to type words into there. Okay. 
Let's dock this over here. Now when you click on an attribute row in the table, it'll highlight that uh, feature in the map. This is going to help you with your land use uh, determinations. You're just going to type them into this chart uh, corresponding to each feature. Now remember, you can't really type in here right now. You have to start an editor session again. Go back to start editing, do land use, OK. And now you should be able to type into these boxes. Uh, so this one we're just going to call pasture good. Uh, the next one, highlight it. Uh, Woods good. Actually, these are all going to be woods good. Uh, the other three of these. Okay, so now we have our attribute table all set uh, with land use and uh, and woods. Let's stop editing uh, and save our edits. Close that attribute table. Okay, so now I have land use shapes and I have hydrologic soil group shapes you know, produced by Soil Data Viewer. And if you overlay them, you can see, well, okay, if you imagine each little sub area on this map, each area is going to have a land use and hydrologic soil group. Uh, now we just want the computer to tally all those up and give us some totals of each one. So to do that, we need to do an intersect uh, in GIS. So you're going to go to Geoprocessing, Intersect, and here's where you input the features that you want to intersect. So we're going to be using hydrologic soil groups and land use. Okay, and the output feature class, uh, you can put that wherever you want. I'm just going to put it in my default geodatabase. Uh, join attributes, we'll keep them all. Tolerance, you can leave blank. Input type, output type, you can leave blank too. Click OK. Let it process away. Completed. Close. Now if you go to that attribute table, you'll see each shape, each area, has a hydrologic group and a land use. Okay, the next thing we want to do is compute the area of each one of those little tiny shapes. It gives you a shape area here, but it's the map units. And we want it in acres for input into EFH2 or, uh, or uh, HydroCAD. Um, so you'll need to add a field here. Remember, out of editing session, so we can add a field on this table. We'll just call it area. Make it a double. Okay. And then we're going to use the Calculate Geometry tool. Uh, you just right click on the area heading, Calculate Geometry. Uh, click Yes, that's fine. And we're going to do the area. Uh, you can use the coordinate system of the data frame, that's fine. And your units are going to be acres US. OK. Yep, that's fine. So that'll give you acres for each little tiny shape. Now, the best way to add up these acres for each land use and hydrologic soil group is with a pivot table. Unfortunately, the pivot table feature that comes with ArcMap is not very good, and it's only available if you have an advanced license. So I'm going to just show you how to export this to Excel and set up the pivot table in Excel. Everybody knows Excel is definitely a great application for pivot tables. You're going to go to Open Attribute Table. Uh, table options and export and under your export file type you just want to make it a text file uh, text is kind of a misnomer it'll actually be a CSV file but whatever okay and we'll call it hydrology output save okay and no, I don't need to add it. And I'm going to go to, go to go to Excel and open that up. Uh, 
Uh, remember, it is delimited uh, with commas. Next. Finish. Alright, so now that gives me all my columns and headers and everything. Just check again. It does have hydrologic group. It does have land use. Okay, that's all good. So now go to insert, pivot table. Uh, use the default range. That's fine. Put it in a new worksheet. Okay. And the fields you want to use are going to be land use, area, and hydrologic group. Okay, and then in Excel, you can just kind of move these around in these columns till you get looking the way you want. And it sums them automatically. Uh, this is actually pretty good. We got pasture, good condition, the A's, 31 acres, A slash D's, 5.8, B is 0.89. Remember, if you move these around, uh, you can just make it uh, total them up differently. Let's leave it how it comes out automatically. All right, and so these area totals are what you're going to be using for cover uh, and land uses in uh, in EFH2 or or HydroCAD. The next component of our watershed model to compute is called the time of concentration. Now this is the time it takes for the furthest droplets of water in the watershed to flow down through the watershed to your design point. And in this course we're going to be covering two methods, one for rural watersheds and one for urban watersheds. So let's look at how we do the rural ones first. Uh, we use a formula shown here. The time of concentration is based on three variables and some constants. We've got the watershed flow length in feet, the curve number, which we've already calculated, and the average watershed slope. So the flow length is pretty easy to uh, figure out. You just draw a line through the watershed where you think the longest flow path is and measure it. The average watershed slope is kind of tricky to do. Uh, but fortunately we have some uh, tools in GIS available at our disposal which help a lot. Um, in, the, in the old days we used traditional methods for computing the average watershed slope and I do want to mention those here uh, for your, your further um, interest if you want to research how to do these. Uh, they're definitely still viable tools and perfectly reasonable for, for your projects. Uh, we can do field observation using a clinometer that's a small uh, device that you cite through which measures slopes of fields. You can utilize average land slopes from soils maps. Remember each soil name on a soil map will uh, usually have a, uh, a final letter which represents the slope range of that soil. You can combine those into, into weighted areas and get a weighted average. You can also measure slopes from topographic maps. Uh, just kind of combined areas with similar slopes and also create a weighted average of that. And also the contour length method uh, is used pretty frequently in that you just measure up the length of the physical contours and put them into the formula divided by the area and that'll give you an average slope. But since this is a GIS focused course we're gonna be using the GIS uh, method of computing a watershed slope. And that's gonna be starting with a, s a smooth kind of low resolution DEM raster. We have 10 meter DEMs for the entire state uh, and those are perfectly suitable for for computing these watershed slopes and from those elevation rasters we're going to create a slope raster and then compute the average slope inside a watershed polygon. Now flow length is fairly straightforward to calculate it's just the longest flow path in your watershed from the furthest point to your design point. It's measured in feet and it usually includes the main water course and a tributary in the watershed. So if you have a ditch at your design point, the longest flow path is probably going to come down through the watershed into your ditch. And remember, water flows perpendicular to the contours. You won't have water going, uh, also you won't have water going parallel to a main water course uh, for any length. And I'll show what that means in a minute. Here's the two examples from the EFH2 manual just has a natural watershed on one side and a watershed with terraces on the other. Remember, you could have a rural watershed with man-made agricultural features that alter the landscape. It's still a rural watershed, and you can still use EFH2 methods, uh, but you'll have some man-made diversions that alter the longest flow path down through. So here's one with some LiDAR contours shown. 
you're looking at these three flow path options, you know, which one would you pick? It's kind of hard to see, but there is a channel underneath this middle orange one. Uh, and that's important to know. If you have channels in your, in your watershed, uh, likely uh, the longest flow path is going to come down, come down through them. So you could look at this short orange one, you know, and you know, trash that pretty quickly. You know, that's not the longest. This other middle orange one is definitely longer. Now this red flow path, I'm not sure it's really perpendicular to contours here, but maybe if you put it further out, it would be per perpendicular, and you could imagine it coming all the way down here. And that would be longer than this middle orange one, but it's not a likely flow path. It's more likely that water from this area will make it to the main channel instead of going parallel to it. All right, so we have a video for ArcMap users uh, going over the details of how to download your DEM rasters and process them to compute the average watershed slope. We're going to be using the lag method to determine the time of concentration for our rural watersheds. The lag method requires two important inputs. First is the longest flow path. Now the longest flow path can be estimated pretty much by taking the furthest point in the watershed, coming down perpendicular to the contours, and following that path all the way to the design point. The second component we need is the average watershed slope. And that's a little bit more tricky to compute. NRCS has developed several hand methods that the soil and water districts have been using for decades to determine the average watershed slope. But GIS professionals have their own method, and that's what we're going to be learning today. We're going to be learning how to use our GIS software to determine average watershed slopes. And to do that, we're going to need to download DEMs. I covered this a little bit in the LiDAR uh, lectures, but I'm just going to quickly review it here uh, as well. Uh, for those of you in New York, which is what this course is geared towards, you're going to go to the New York State GIS Clearinghouse, find the ortho imagery link, and then open the digital ortho imagery application. It's a little bit confusing. This is the, also the place where you download aerial photos. They just bundled the download uh, DEM function into this here. So you'll zoom into an area of interest. You have to be zoomed in quite a ways to be able to download. Say for this area, go over and look for the download button. It's a file folder with an arrow on it. Click that. Download in the current view. And then a panel will pop up on the left, giving you the available ortho photos and the available DEM results. So for this area, the only DEMs we have available are USGS DEC 10 meter DEMs from Cougar. We have 10 meter DEMs for the entire state of New York. In other areas, there'll also be a two meter, four meter, five meter, what have you, uh, LiDAR results. So wherever your area is, I encourage you to download the highest resolution data. If there's LiDAR available, use that for your watershed, time of concentration, and, uh, and delineation. If only 10 meter DEMs are available, use that. That's, uh, that'll work too. Here we have ArcGIS opened, and I have a DEM that I downloaded from the clearinghouse loaded. It's a 2 meter LiDAR data set. Now in a DEM, each pixel represents an elevation instead of an actual color. So the brightest whites are the highest points in the contour map, and the darkest blacks are the lowest points. I also have a simple watershed drawn in and contours displayed uh, based on the DEM. Now in order to find the average watershed slope, we're going to create a separate slope raster. Then use the computer to take the average of each pixel in the watershed. See, to create an average slope raster, we can just take each cell based on the neighboring cell elevations, uh, the computer can compute the slope at that cell. So to do that, you need to look for your spatial analyst tools. Here's the Arc Toolbox. And it's under Spatial Analyst Tools and then Surface. And Slope is the tool you want. The input raster is just going to be our 2 meter DEM. Output raster can be whatever you'd like to name it. The output measurement uh, for lots of hydrology studies on large scales, they'll use degrees. But in our case, we want percent rise. 
Uh, that's the input that EFH2 is expecting, the percent rise of slope. And Z factor is optional. The Z factor here is not for converting from metric to English per se. It's really to convert what, if your DEM is in a different units than your ground mapping, then you'll need to put in a Z factor to compensate for that. In this case, we know that the DEM is in meters and the ground is also in meters, so we'll leave it at one. Once that's all input, you can click OK. It'll chug away. Close that, move the toolbox off. I'm going to do, uh, turn off those contours and zoom in on the watershed. Okay, so if you look at the key, you'll see the darkest greens are the lowest slopes and the brightest reds are the highest slopes. So now we have a raster where every pixel represents a slope and all we need to do is add them all up, divide by the total, and we'll have an average slope. Now to do that, we're going to look for the Zonal Statistics as Table tool. Let me move the toolbox back on. Uh, we're still under the Spatial Analyst tools, but not Surface anymore. We're going to look for Zonal and Zonal Statistics as Table. I prefer this one to Zonal Statistics just because it creates a separate table for you uh, so you don't get confused or, or wonder where it got buried. Zonal Statistics as Table. Okay, the first input is the raster or feature zone data. In our case, we only have one zone. We have one watershed, which we want to create an average slope for. If you had 100 watersheds in a shapefile, that would be fine too. It would do them for each watershed. So in this case, uh, TC testing is the name of our shapefile where the watershed is. Uh, the zone field, this is just the value that's going to be put into the uh, zone table we're just going to leave it as ID because we only have one. The input value raster, these are the values which you're going to be creating the statistics on. So it's the 2 meter slope raster, not the original DEM. Output table, we'll just call it that, that's fine. And statistics type, uh, we are only interested in the mean, but let's just do all for the sake of uh, curiosity, see what happens. Click OK, and that'll run the table. Close it, move that away. And then you'll look in your table contents for the table. Here it is right here. And open it. And that'll give you all the statistics for that watershed uh, as the slope raster. So this is how many pixels were in that zone, the area of it, the minimum, maximum range, and the mean is what we're interested in, uh, which is 17%. So once you've computed your longest flow path and your average slope, you'll take those two inputs over to EFH2, and input them, and that'll compute the time of concentration via the lag method. Now I do want to quick mention that there is some research uh, out there that um, checks whether using the finest resolution LiDAR files really result in the most accurate uh, results. Uh, basically by checking field verified slopes against uh, LiDAR. And there's some discussion definitely about coarsening LiDAR files to lower the resolution and kind of smooth them out. And that is definitely an option, uh, but it's more advanced than we need to get to in this course. Uh, so for your projects, feel free to use uh, the finest detail LiDAR without any post-processing, uh, just what you get from uh, the clearinghouse. But if you want to get into more advanced hydrology research, uh, that's definitely out there uh, on the web as well. Up until now, everything we've covered pretty much applies uniformly to rural hydrology and urban hydrology. However, the time of concentration calculation is usually a bit different for urban hydrology, but that depends on the jurisdiction you're working in. Since this course is primarily intended for New York State uh, that designers, they would be using the New York State Stormwater Design Manual. Okay, if you're in another state, this might not apply to you, or if you're overseas, it definitely doesn't. So, uh, what's the caveat in the Stormwater Manual? It says, TR-55 and TR-20, or approved equivalent, shall be used for determining the peak discharge rates. Remember this, if you use the Stormwater Manual, you know that there's kind of separate requirements for water quality control, uh, from water quantity control. 
but your hydrologic model is primarily going to be used for water quantity control. You're determining the peak flow for the 24-hour storm events. The other thing in the stormwater manual is this down here. It says the length of overland flow used in time of concentration calculations is limited to no more than 100 feet for post-development conditions. And this is important because in the TR-55 manual it says you can use a limit of up to 300 feet. And that's important because this sheet flow or overland flow is a major component of the time of concentration. Uh, flow over land in this fashion is very slow, so a longer distance makes your time of concentration much, much longer, which reduces the peak flow in your hydrograph. So this 100 feet is, is fairly limiting. Uh, in the TR-55 manual, they specify 300, but that's really only for ideal flat surfaces, like perfectly paved parking lots. It just doesn't happen in nature or in regular built construction. So you might remember from previous lecture I mentioned TR-55, Urban Hydrology for Small Watersheds. It's basically the manual for the TR-20 computer program. Okay, the TR-20 doesn't really have a user guide or a manual. You're just supposed to read TR-55 and pick out the relevant details. But TR-55 in itself is a hand method for doing the TR-20 method uh, using worksheets. So we're actually going to look at one of the worksheets uh, in it. The time concentration worksheet is split into three segments. The first is sheet flow, or overland flow, as it's called in the New York State Design uh, Stormwater Design Manual. This is the first flow path of the water when it, the rain lands on the surface. It flows along the ground in a very thin sheet. After 100 feet, it switches to shallow concentrated flow. And this is you know, even less defined than the sheet flow. It's kind of channeled into little ripples. It's like between sheet flow and channel flow, but neither of them uh, quite. And then once you find a channel in your watershed, you need to model that as channel flow. So it's fairly subjective separating out these three segments in a watershed. Typically we just say sheet flow is 100 feet, and then we find the first recognizable channel in the longest flow path and then whatever distance between that 100 foot mark and the first channel we just call that shallow concentrated flow. So it's a fairly subjective experience and that's why in some jurisdictions they don't use this TR55 method they just use the curve number or lag method which we learned for rural watersheds. But in New York State, you should, you should be using this TR-55 segmented method. Let's quick look at some of the inputs that go into each one. For sheet flow, you've got surface description, uh, the Manning's roughness coefficient, flow length, the two-year 24-hour rainfall. Uh, we'll cover where to get rainfall amounts when we look at the software uh, in the next section. And the land slope. And that just goes into a formula and it computes it. Shallow concentrated flow is even less inputs. You just need the flow length, the slope, and average velocity, and the surface description. And these are all uh, in a calculator in HydroCAD, which we're going to look at in a minute. For channel flow, it's the typical channel parameters. Um, and these are for the bank full flow, typically. Uh, so you'll need to have survey data or be able to come up with a good estimate for your channel size. Here's the example from the TR-55 manual. It's just a watershed, supposedly in Tennessee. And they give you the design data for each one of these segments. 100 foot of sheet flow, 1400 foot of shallow concentrated flow, and then 7300 feet of uh, channel flow. So they have this all worked out in the TR-55 manual, so I'm not going to go through that uh, with you right now. But I would like to put all the inputs into HydroCAD to show you where to put them. And then we can check our answers against the manual and see if it comes out the same. So let me jump over to HydroCAD. In HydroCAD, once you've got a project started and a subcatchment added to the watershed, or added to the project, you just double click on it. And here's where you enter all your parameters for the watershed. Uh, the area tab is where you compute your weighted T CN value. And the TC tab is where you compute the time of concentration. So we'll just look at the design data from the TR-55 example and start adding it in. 
the first is going to be sheet flow so you click the edit TC button here's where you select which method uh, they do offer the lag CN method for rural watersheds that's what we learned for the rural lectures uh, but I'm going to do sheet flow here description I'm just going to call it sheet surface description they're saying it is dense grass so that populates the Manning's number the flow length is 100 the 24 hour uh, two year rainfall is 3.6 inches that's already typed in there and then the land slope uh, dense grass slope is 0 0.01 and that's in feet per feet not percent okay once that's in just click OK the next one is shallow concentrated flow surface description unpaved the flow length is 1400 and the slope is also a 1% click OK and finally the channel flow The area is, let's see, 27 square feet. The wetted perimeter is 28.2. The slope is half a percent. And Manning's N is 0.05 flow length 7300 feet all right so that adds up the time uh, the time of concentration for each one of these segments and adds them together and you get 91.9 minutes so let's jump back and look at uh, what the TR55 uh, total time was and see if they're the same and here's the result from the TR55 worksheet it's 1.53 hours so you can do the math 91.9 minutes is 1.53 hours so they match now uh, I encourage you to look at that through that example and the filled out worksheet 3 in the TR55 manual hopefully you've reviewed that manual already but if you not you haven't go ahead and take an opportunity to do that all right the next section we're going to be looking at the software packages themselves EFH2 and HydroCAD and how to use them we'll also be covering where to get the rainfall data to input into those EFH2 is the program we're going to be using for our rural hydrological models now this data in particular only applies to practices that are built in New York State we have New York State rainfall and New York State distributions well, actually, they're for the northeast of the United States. Um, but if you're using this program in another part of the country, you'll have different rainfall and different distributions, uh, possibly. So you just go to the NRCS Engineering New York website, scroll down to the bottom, and they have a whole section on EFH2. Uh, if you click down here, you can read these paragraphs. There's even a supplement that you can read. Uh, all, contains all kinds of good data. Uh, but for now, just click over to the Storm Distribution Regions map. That's this colorful one over here. And each county area has either one or two storm distributions associated with it. Okay, let's type A, B, C, or D. Some counties fall entirely within one uh, type range, and others have these border areas uh, which you can click. And it'll give you a little inset map to, to show exactly where they want you to stop using type A and start using type B. So before you even e open up EFH2 you'll need to go to this map and figure out what rainfall distribution you're going to be using. In addition as far as rainfall amounts they come preloaded with EFH2 for New York and many other states but not all of the states. In New York we have some counties that have two rainfall amounts. Okay, Most have only one rainfall amount you'll just pick that from a drop down in EF EF EFH2 but some have split uh, amounts. So say for this county um, you have Steuben North and Steuben South. Okay so you'll need to know whether you're north or south because it'll be a different rainfall amount uh, that you'll select in EFH2. As far as downloading and installing EFH2 it's fairly straightforward. 
you can search for EFH2 NRCS download and just get it. Uh, you just download it here. Now once it's installed, you do need, do need to change the name of one of the data files. And I'll show you how to do that now. You'll just go to computer, your C drive, you're looking for program files, which might be program files x86 if you're in 64-bit windows. Scroll down and look for a USDA. And inside there, EFH2. You'll see a whole bunch of rain, uh, rainfall files. They're just called county dot and then your state abbreviation. All right, state uh, county dot ny is included, so that's good for our purposes. But keep going down and you'll find a bunch of type files. Okay, there's different distribution type files for different parts of the country, and there's um, a, one for type for the original type 1, type 2, type 3. Now, I've already done this. I've taken the original type file and renamed it as type original. And then I've taken the type underscore northeast file and renamed it to be type.rf. Okay? You don't need to keep the original type file. It just has 1, 2, 3, 2A two in it. Uh, but you need to rename the type underscore northeast file to be type.rf in order for the program to find it. It's looking for that type.rf file and it, uh, it won't even see these other ones. All right, but if you're in a different part of the country, uh, one of these other ones might be appropriate. I'm not actually sure. So check with your state engineer uh, for NRCS. Now once you have that figured out, you can run the program. It's in Engineering Applications, EFH2, EFH2. Uh, the first tab is just an introduction. It has kind of the same caveats that the website shows, just kind of the limitations that it's intended for, 1 to 2,000 acres, uh, watershed slope limitations, and hydraulic limitations. So let's jump to the basic data pa page and see what needs to be input there. Client doesn't need to be filled in. You can put whatever you want. State is where you put in your two-letter state abbreviation. Until you put that in, this county drop-down won't work right. All right, it'll say, please enter the state abbreviation. So I'm going to put a New York here, and that'll tell it to use the county.ny rainfall file. And as I scroll down the list, well, let's just look at Albany. Albany has a north and a south. But you see here in this list, it has two souths listed. That's just a reminder to the user that there are two distribution types for that area. So Albany South has a specific rainfall, which is different from Albany North, and there are also B and C distribution areas in that Albany South area. And now selecting this B or C doesn't actually select that distribution in the program. It's just a reminder that you'll have to do that later. So say we're in Albany South Northeast Regional Climate Center C. You can select it here. That'll select the rainfall amount. But to select the distribution, you have to go to the Rainfall Discharge Data page and select it manually there. So it's going to be NRCC C. Go back to basic data. We need to type in drainage area, say it's 100 acres. Runoff curve number, you can type this in directly or you can use the calculator that's built in. Let's check that out quick. It has all the, all the uh, A, B, C, and D soils for each uh, soil cover type that's you know covered in the Tier 55 manual or in the FH2 manual. Um, you have the urban areas, residential districts, all that kind of stuff. Let's go down to agricultural lands and say we're, we've got 50 acres of bare soil in B and uh, row crops in D soil 50 acres too. All right, so that'll compute a weighted curve number of 86. You can accept it here and it'll populate that box back on the basic data page. Watershed length, uh, that needs to be a number uh, more than 200, I believe. Yep, 226,000, so let's say 500. Watershed slope, 12%. And that gives it a warning. Now the calculated time of concentration is 0 0.06 hours. TC is adjusted to 0 0.10 hours. That's okay. If your time of concentration is below that minimum, uh, it'll just bump it up to the minimum of 0 0.10 hours. That's fine for your model. Uh, nothing to be too worried about. 
Once the basic data is input, it just calculates it in the background. So when you go to the rainfall discharge data tab, uh, your peak flows and runoff uh, inches will already be calculated. It's just looking up these 24 inch rainfall values from the county.ny data file, inputting those, running the program, and getting your peak flow in CFS. Now you'll notice if you look around there's no place to find a hydrograph. It's not doing uh, that for you. So if you need to, uh, to, to route a hydrograph through a practice, uh, this program is not for you. It's only going to compute the peak flows uh, for, for your practices like um, uh, diversions or ditches or, or what have you. Anywhere where you just need a peak flow and not a total hydrograph. Alright, the next lecture is going to look at kind of doing the same basic inputs into, uh, into HydroCAD uh, for doing more urban sites or larger rural areas. HydroCAD is the hydrological modeling software we should be using for urban watersheds and any rural watersheds that exceed the limitations of EFH2, plus any watershed projects where we want to develop a full hydrograph, say for pond routing or storage. Um, one of the kind of quirks of HydroCAD is that there's a variety of rainfall and storm distribution types currently allowed in New York State. Okay, remember we should be following the New York State Stormwater Design Manual and that allows you to use the TR55 uh, storm distributions and rainfall which are both somewhat out of date. So considering that this course is introductory and it's geared towards people just learning about hydrology, I'm going to suggest that you totally dispense with the type 1, 2, 3 uh, distributions and the old TP40 rainfall data and just use the newer uh, Northeast Regional Climate Center rainfall and storm distributions. Okay, we've covered this a little bit if you've watched the EFH2 uh, a lecture and, and the rainfall and the distributions will be the same for this. If you are looking for information on it, you'll want to go to the New York NRCS engineering website pull that up and scroll to the bottom and look for the EFH2 section. That'll show the maps that you'll need uh, when when pulling this data into HydroCAD. First thing you need to note is the storm distributions regions. If you click on that, that'll bring up a map. You can see most of the counties in New York are fully within one distribution area, but some have uh, one or two uh, different ones. You'll just want to figure out where your project is located and if it's in one of these border areas click on the the blow up and it'll show exactly where they want you to use the type a type b and so on uh, distribution regions one further thing you'll need to note from this website is the rainfall sub areas most of the counties in new york have just one rainfall amount for the whole county but some are split into two areas so if your project is in one of these counties, you'll need to click on the map uh, to bring up the inset, and then it's split up by towns. You can just figure out which towns are in Washington North and which ones are in Washington South. So from this NRCS engineering website, you're going to need to figure out which distribution to use, A, B, C, or D, and if your county has sub-rainfall areas, which one it's going to be in. Now let's jump over to HydroCAD and see where we get this data. Uh, and which tables to pull it from. Just a quick note about HydroCAD, it's definitely the modeling package that I recommend for urban projects. And to test it out and learn it, you should use the HydroCAD sampler. The sampler is a free download, it just has a few limitations, being you can only use it for 60 minutes before it closes and you have to reopen it, and you can only save project up to five nodes. Alright, in this project we're just going to be using one node, a simple watershed. So you download it and install that. I think you have to register too. I can't quite remember. I did it a while ago. When you start it up, it'll ask you to click OK to be in your 60 minute evaluation period. And I'll do that. And once you get running, it'll ask you to click here to open or create a project. All right, so I'm just gonna create a new project called Tim. And create it. Now when I start a new project, the first thing I want to do is set up the calculation parameters, uh, including the rainfall and storm distribution. To do that, look for the calculator button up at the top, calculation settings. 
Okay, on the general tab, just do runoff method SCSTR20. That's the method we're doing. For the reach routing and pond routing, just leave those as the defaults. You'll want to read up on what to use if you end up doing uh, reach routing or pond routing. For this case, we're just doing a simple watershed uh, runoff. Click over to the rainfall tab, and there's a few options here we need to select. On the storm type, remember how I said we're going to be using the Northeast Regional Climate Center distributions for this course? Click the drop down for that and scroll up until you find NRCC. Okay, expand that and do 24 hour. That's going to populate this drop down for A, B, C, or D. All right, so depending on where your project is located uh, on that NRCS New York engineering map, you're going to be picking A, B, C, or D for your storm distribution. Storm duration is going to be 24 hours. Back to back storms, this is an option you can play with if you choose. Uh, definitely read the help file for what it means. Depth, this will be populated once we get rainfall events in. And AMC is the antecedent moisture condition. Just leave that at the default value of 2. Again, you can read the help file for what exactly that means. On all these dialog boxes, the help file is really useful. Uh, you can just click help, it'll come up and give links to all the terms that appear on that dialog. For rainfall, we're going to be doing an import events from the Atlas 14 database. Now the Atlas 14 database is pretty old, but it has been recently updated and the latest version of HydroCAD has the most recent updates. These will have the same rainfall amounts for each county and sub-county area that NRCS is using for the EFH2 method and their rainfall files. So do import events from, and you want a lookup table. All right, HydroCAD comes with two lookup tables. There's TP40 and Atlas 14. So you want Atlas 14, and then scroll down until you find New York State. And once you get to New York, you'll have all those county rainfalls and any counties that have sub areas, you'll have those rainfall values as well. So say your uh, project was in Schoharie County North. You can select that one. Select the storm distribution and click OK. And that'll bring all those rainfall events into your project. Okay, when you're running HydroCAD, you're going to select what year the storm is, so what year frequency. So for each run of HydroCAD, you're going to be selecting uh, a one year, two year, five year, 10 year, 25, 50, or 100. Okay, and you can look at uh, each of those depths here if you want to select them, uh, whatever you want to do, click apply. Okay, and once you click apply, these those will show up in the, the main menu drop down. All right, that's all you need to fill in on the rainfall page. Time span is next. Um, start time and end time, you can fiddle with those. For the uh, TR20 method, which we are using, uh, there's typically no runoff for the first few hours of a storm because the runoff has to exceed the initial abstraction. Okay, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up in the HydroCAD help. Uh, it's just the way the formula is set up, it's designed to model initial uh, soaking in of rain so that runoff does not immediately run off to your design point. So just for consistency, let's do 0 and 24 for our 24 hour storm, just so we can see that there's no rainfall coming in, in those first few hours. Time increment is kind of like the step for the hydrograph. It just determines the number of hydrograph points. If you have something really complicated going on in your watershed, you could decrease this to get kind of better accuracy. But for us, let's just leave it at 0.05. Uh, reports, unit hydro, advanced, resize. These are all kind of advanced ones that we're not going to deal with right now. But on each window, just click the help file and it'll tell you what everything exactly means. So let's click apply then OK to go back to the main window. To add a watershed, you just click and drag a subcatchment from this toolbar over on the left, and then right click and do edit. And that brings up the four main tabs of the edit window. Generally, you're just putting in the name, say the north field. Area, this is the CN calculator. 
that you're going to put in your CN values that you came up with in GIS. Um, for this, we'll just do a, uh, a lookup. It gives all the lookup values that are in EFH2 and TR55. Uh, so, so look down to say um, straight row crops or, or bare soil. Let's say bare soil um, type D. Okay, double click that, and we'll do. Uh, straight row crops, B soil, poor. Okay, and just type in the acreage that you have for each of those which you have mapped out of your drainage area. For time of concentration, remember we covered this a little bit in the time of concentration lecture. You can use either the lag method or the uh, chopped up method, a sheet flow, shallow concentrated channel flow. So if you're using the lag method, you just um, add it like this and type in your parameters, the average land slope, contour interval, contour length, hydraulic length, okay, and it'll compute your uh, your time of concentration that way. Or you can put in each individual row. See so if you put in sheet flow, it'll give you the ask for you ask for the parameters for that. And same with shallow concentrated and, and channel flow. Uh, so for the for sake of this example, I'm just going to do direct entry. Uh, type in 15 minutes and do OK. So that'll do a 15 minute time of concentration for this watershed. So once you have areas put in and time of concentration input and also rainfall added, then you can run the model and get a hydrograph. We click apply and OK on this window. And then you just want to drop down and pick the design storm. Say you want to do the 10-year design storm, then you double click on the node. Okay, check for any errors. It says hint longer time span advised for full volumes. Okay, that means that this hydrograph has not quite come down all the way back to zero at 24 hours. So if you know if you need the whole volume of the storm, you'll need to extend that out. Here's the hydrograph. You can see um, the rainfall doesn't start producing runoff until about hour seven of the storm. It comes up to a peak and it goes back down. All right, there's all kinds of options on this graph. All right, you can do summary, hydrograph. Uh, it'll show the events. Okay, all these options are there too. I feel free to explore this program at your leisure. Uh, we're just covering kind of the basics of setting up a high setting up a drainage area and computing the runoff. All right. Also, YouTube has a ton of videos on HydroCAD, many produced by uh, the software developer himself. So feel free to check those out if you want to get into more advanced modeling. We're just scratching the surface of it with this course. The rational method is a good hydrology option for modeling urban storm sewer networks where the watersheds are fairly small, uh, you don't need a pond routing analysis at the end, um, and things are fairly fairly uniform. Now, if you're uh, asked to do the rational method uh, for your job, hopefully you work at a company that has either a Bentley or Autodesk subscription uh, 3D package. Uh, I feel those uh, packages are much better suited to doing storm sewer design because they formulate into 3D designs at the end of the day, and that helps you, uh, you know, design inlet elevations and pipe invert elevations. Uh, however, HydroCAD does have this functionality for, uh, for modeling the rational method built in. So for this case, I don't have uh, Bentley Inroads or Autodesk Storm and Sanitary, uh, so I'm just going to be showing it in HydroCAD. But to use the rational method in HydroCAD, first you need to download an IDF curve. That is an intensity duration frequency curve. And in New York State, we get those from the Northeast Regional Climate Center. Uh, for most other states in the country, you'll get it from the precipitation frequency server that NOAA uh, puts on. And a quick note, the Northeast Regional Climate Center server is going to get rolled into the precipitation frequency server sometime in the near future, uh, but not sure when. So if you go to the Northeast Regional Climate Center site, look for data and products. It's like a tab that shows up at the top here. And click extreme precipitation tables text slash CSV.
Then locate your site on the map. Uh, let's say um, here. In Dolgeville. And double click. And then there should be an option at the bottom. You might have to scroll down to see it. Uh, for smoothing, you want no smoothing. And then club, click Submit. Then however your browser set up, it might ask you to save the file or it might just download it to your downloads file. Here I have just downloaded it. I'm going to open it. It's just a text file with a whole ton of numbers in it in a standardized format. However, we need to save it as an extension that HydroCAD will recognize. So go to File, Save As. And then you're looking for your HydroCAD program folder, which should be in C, Program Files, or Program Files x86. Then HydroCAD. And then you want to put it in the IDF folder. Okay, so give it a name, call it New York, Dolgeville, and then the extension needs to be HCI, not TXT. And save it. Now when you open up HydroCAD, it will look in that folder and it'll be able to find that IDF curve. So I'm going to close this. Start up HydroCAD. And when I start up HydroCAD, I want to set up the rainfall data first. Well, first I'm going to open a project. I'm going to create a new one called uh, New Rational. Create it. Then click the calculator button to set up the rainfall data. For the general tab, I'm going to click the rational method instead of the TR SES TR20 method. Then on the rainfall tab, I need to point to that IDF file that I just saved. So you look for the IDF file drop down, click it, and hopefully that IDF file is in that list. Here it's New York Dolgeville. Click that. And then for the event drop down, you're going to need to put in whatever storm frequency you're designing to. And this will depend on the type of road or the road classification that you, you're creating your storm sewer network on. Uh, so for this case, let's do the five year storm. Okay, and it also asks for the storm duration. Okay, the duration for the rational method is equal to the time of concentration. And for most storm sewer networks, the minimum time of concentration is five minutes and most real time of concentrations will be less than that. So for convention, we usually do five minutes. Then click apply and okay. Now it's the same as a TR55 method for modeling. You just click and drag a subcatchment into the project area. You can right click and edit it. Now give it whatever name you want. Then on the area tab, you put in your areas and C values. Now the C values sound like CN values from the TR55 method, but they're not the same. They range from 0 to 1 instead of from 30 to 100. Okay, so you have to uh, just keep that in mind that you're not using C value, CN values in this column. Uh, so for this one, I'm going to input an area, 1 acre, a C value of 0.98. Description, I'm going to call it a parking lot. Now there's no lookup table in HydroCAD for these C values. You have to get them from a hydrological reference. If you're in New York State, I highly recommend the New York State DOT Highway Design Manual, Chapter 8 on Highway Drainage. They have a nice chart in here which covers most of uh, the scenarios you'd want. These C values are somewhat subjective. There's a good range on them here. And if you look at other hydrological references, they might have different values listed for each type of, of surface cover. Uh, so feel free to browse them and use them as you wish. But back to HydroCAD. Once we've got the C value listed and the area in, go to the Time of Concentration tab. And for most storm strewer networks, I said the time of concentration will be less than five minutes, but we use five minutes as a minimum. So I'm just going to put a direct entry in here uh, for five minutes. Alternatively, you can calculate the 
the time of concentration using the lag flow method, sheet flow, any of these other ones, uh, just like we would with the tier 55 method. I cancel that. So once you have time of concentration and area, you can apply and go back to the project. Double clicking the watershed produces a hydrograph with the peak flow. However, this is not a real hydrograph like you would use for pond routing with the TR55 or SES TR20 method. Uh, so you're just going to be get grabbing the peak flow from this diagram. Okay, kind of ignore the hydrograph. It's not a real hydrograph. Just use the peak flow uh, for doing your design. Our rural watershed hydrology scenario is going to be done in ArcGIS. I have answers and instructions uh, attached to this lecture as PDFs. Uh, the scenario is in an agricultural area in uh, the town of Argyle. It's just north of Summit Lake. If, so if you find this lake on a map, it's pretty close to that. Uh, just go north a little bit uh, between these two roads, uh, pretty much right between it. If you look for this little pond, it's just to the north of that, uh, right in this area. So I'm just going to zoom into there uh, to give a better, better look at it. And the coordinates for this point are in the instructions, uh, both as UTMs and uh, as an ad address to help you find it. Uh, we're just going to suppose that the farmer is putting in a laneway or an access road uh, just to the north of this tree line. And there's a ditch here that he needs to cross. So I need you to compute the watershed area for this, uh, this watershed. There's two meter DEMs available from the clearinghouse, so you'll need to download those. Uh, delineate the watershed. Compute the average slope and the longest flow path. Do all your CN calculations to determine the land use and whatnot. Input all that data into FH2 and come up with the results. And check them against mine and see how you did.